PHL 17 presents In Focus, a look at the issues affecting the Philadelphia region. Now your host, Steve Highsmith. Whether you're getting out of college soon, looking for a job, or changing careers, there's a natural level of anxiety about your future. We may have some good advice for you in the next few minutes. Good morning. I'm Steve Highsmith, and welcome to In Focus. With me now is Ford Myers, author of Get the Job You Want Even When No One's Hiring. Mr. Myers is president of Career Potential LLC and is a veteran of America's largest career consulting companies. Ford, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Steve. Great to be here. So in these economic times, is there something really different about our times now compared to times before? It's a fundamental shift. There's an absolute change from the way it used to be to the way it is today. And the work that I do is all about teaching people, helping people to make that transition and to be more successful and more effective with the realities of today's job market. When you look at general strategies that apply pretty much to everybody, can we pinpoint two or three things that are, that are good starting points of advice? Well, one overarching philosophy, I think, is that everyone, whether you're entry level, mid-level, or senior level, everyone needs to take more responsibility. They can no longer count on the human resources department or the industry or the employer to take care of their career. Hmm. We have to take 100 percent responsibility for our own career success. So it means learning new skills, it means adopting new behaviors, it means really having a different mindset in the entire way we manage our careers, not just job search, but the way we manage our entire careers. Does this mean that we will be less loyal to our employer? It does, but let's flip it around. Look at the way that employers are now less loyal to the employees. The contract between employers and employees has changed completely in the past 10 or 15 years. There used to be a real bond of loyalty. You stay with one company 30 years, retire with a gold watch, they take care of you, you take care of them. Not anymore. That's all gone out the window in the past decade or so. So less loyal, yes, but it goes both ways. For some people, they will look at that reality and embrace it. There'll be others that are frightened by it, that are made nervous by it, even become more anxious. How do you begin to deal with what you're describing as a volatile environment in which no one cares for me, I have to care for myself, and I have to keep learning new things all the time? How do you know what direction to go into? Again, where do you begin? You begin at the beginning, small steps, baby steps. When we work with clients, we teach them skills that start small, begin to shift their thinking, give people a new perspective. They're usually kind of surprised, kind of shocked, or maybe even anxious in the beginning. But then over time, they begin to learn it bit by bit. Their eyes start to open. They start to see the light. And you can see that they start to do better. They get momentum. They start to feel even more empowered. Hmm. Now, this break of the loyalty bond, the fact that people have to take more responsibility, it can sound daunting, but actually, in the end, it's liberating because each person takes full responsibility. You're liberated because you don't feel stuck or beholden to one organization or one person. You actually have more freedom, you have more say, and you have more options. In this model, do you then look at what you're doing in each place that you work as a job or do you can you still look and think of a career well each opportunity each op each company where you work each job you get should be looked at in my opinion as an assignment as a contract mm -hmm. you're there temporarily it's a stepping stone stepping stone to what well that's where the person the employee needs to have a, a plan a kind of a blueprint for their career we're not just thinking about job, job, job. We're thinking about a long-term career plan, which is established and designed near the beginning of one's career. And then each job is essentially a way station, an assignment, a contract on the way towards reaching your ultimate goal. Well, let's take a look at a couple of examples then, because people are going to feel, after hearing what you just said, that they're in different boats, even though we're all in the same pond of water. And, and, and the person who's in college right now, for example, is going to be saying, all right, you're telling me how I should begin, and we'll deal with that in a moment. But we've had in the last few years in particular a lot of 40-somethings, 50-somethings, 60-somethings who've had sudden career shifts yes. and job shifts, and they might be hearing you and saying, wait, well, you're telling me that I need to start from the beginning to have a, a right plan. I'm well past the beginning. 
Absolutely. So let's deal with each of those cases, for example. So say you're, you're in college right now, you're going to be a junior in college. What, what should you be doing and thinking? Well, again, we have to start younger and earlier than we used to. In the old days, like when I was in college, for example, um, you could do your academic work, you could take the summers off, maybe you get a job in the summer part-time, uh, and you didn't really worry about it. You just figured, eh, you know, I'll wait until I finish college and then I'll send out some applications and I'll be all right. And that was pretty much true back in those days. Not anymore. These days, I think that kids in college should start right from freshman year getting real work experience. Even if they don't need it financially, they need it from a career perspective. So work on the campus or work during holiday season and summers, real jobs. You could start low, start at the beginning, but get some real world experience. Not necessarily in your field, you're just saying no, any job. Any job that's gonna give you real world experience. You know, learn a little bit about business. Learn a little about getting along with people and working towards a common business goal. Um, over time, they can actually build up a resume, even though they're still in school. And the resume shows tangible accomplishments, not just, I worked here for three months, no, but actual accomplishments. So that when you finally get out of school, uh, and assuming you've had some career counseling along the way, which is another topic we should touch on, then they kind of have a plan when they're graduating. They don't graduate and go, oh, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Instead, they graduate and they have a bit of a plan, even if it's only for the next three to five years. It's still a plan. They have tangible experience. They have somewhat of a goal. They've gotten some help and some guidance along the way. At least they have a starting place. What about that career counseling, though? So every college pretty much says it has advisors available to guide the student. Yes. Does that happen? Well, unfortunately, no. Some schools do have a pretty good career counseling departments. Many schools do not. And even the ones who do have decent career counseling departments, um, they don't necessarily have their finger on the pulse of the outside world, the real world, the business world. They tend to be a little bit insular, a little bit ivory tower. Now, I'm not complaining about every career office across the nation. Some of them are great, some of them are not, some of them are not so great. But in my opinion, a, a kid coming through college should get some counseling. Sure, they should check out their uh, career counseling office on campus, but I think they should go beyond that. I think that they should talk to their parents and their parents' friends. I think they should seek out counsel in the real world, let's say, talk to some business leaders, you know, go out and do a little bit of networking. These are skills that we used to think only needed to be developed later in life. I think these skills now need to be developed much, much younger. Are advisors sometimes cookie cuttering, <laughs> cutting the, the, yeah. the, the kids? Uh, so for example, you're in college, you go talk to your counselor and the counselor says, well, I think you ought to do this, take these courses to, and do that, not really knowing what that young person really wants to do or what their real skill set could be? That does happen. And another thing that I recommend to guard against that problem is career testing. I believe that every kid coming through college should have a battery of career tests. We do career testing in our business. The college campuses sometimes do it, or they can hire an outside service to do it. But what that gives you, Steve, is tangible evidence. It gives you empirical proof of what you desire, what you prefer, what you're good at, what kind of career direction might make sense for you. When you say uh, get a job, though, are you ruling out internships that might not pay? Oh, no. I think internships are a great idea, fantastic idea. It's not about making the big bucks when you're going through college. I mean, of course, kids sometimes have to make money, but I'm more interested in the opportunity. I'm more interested in connecting with the right people and learning something that's really valuable for your future. How does any of what you just said differ for the person that's in their 40s or 50s or 60s trying to still have a good job that pays a good wage? Sure. Well, as you said before, and everybody knows there's a lot of people out there in their 40s, 50s, even 60s who have had disruptions in their careers. It's been terrible out there. You know, it's been the worst job market in 80 years. Now, we can talk about that a lot. I wrote a whole book about this subject. But the point is, when someone's at mid-career, let's just call it mid-career, um, of course, they're not going to go out and get an internship in a, you know, in, in a restaurant or working uh, at a TV station like this. They're farther along in their careers. They need to make a real living. They need to maintain their standard of living, at least as, as well as they can. So 
we do what's, it's almost like remedial training. Mm -hmm. We take a person at that age and quickly try to teach them some of the fundamental skills that they really should have had all along. For example, many clients will come to us and uh, at, at mid-career and we'll start to work with them and I'll ask them, well, what about your network? And they'll go, my what? Well, don't you have a network? Haven't you kept your network alive? No. They say, I've had the same job for 25 years. I, I never talked to anybody except the people in my company. Mm. See, that's a problem. Or how about this? Do you have any updated documents, resume, or any other cover letters, things like that? No, I haven't done one in 20 years. See, this is a problem. These people were not managing their careers. So we have to do some remedial training. But is the resume overrated? Yes, it is overrated. Okay, so why do I need to be so concerned about one? Because even though the resume is not the be all and end all, it is absolutely necessary. And it has to be great. It can't be just okay, it can't be fair. It has to be great. It has to jump off the it's page. necessary, has to be great. Yes, but there's many other tools in the toolkit that also need to be present. Well, let's get to the overrated in a minute. Uh, yeah. Give me two or three points on how it can be great. Okay, sure. There's different kinds of resumes. Uh, one kind of resume just sort of sits there. It's what I call a tombstone resume. And it just lists companies and dates and what you were responsible for and your education. All right. It's factual. It's just data. Then the other kind of resume, which I prefer, is the one that really grabs you by the neck. And the reason it does that is because it features real world accomplishments. It highlights where you as the candidate, where you went above and beyond, where you produced real results, tangible, measurable results, where you went the extra mile and added significant value. That kind of resume grabs people by the neck. So I could put where I worked, I could put my title, but then I would say, lead project that increased revenues by 20% exactly. in six months over Precisely. something like that. Exactly. Got it. Uh, I want to talk to you about why resumes are overrated and also get some advice, as we said, for, for everyone that's affected by this as we drill down a little bit more into how you present yourself, the interview, okay. and more. More with Ford Myers ahead on In Focus on PHL 17. Back on In Focus, I'm Steve Highsmith. We're talking about taking charge of your career and getting a job that pays you what you want, or within reason. With me is Ford Myers, author of Get the Job You Want Even When No One's Hiring. So let's finish up on resumes if we can. So sure. it's important to make it unique as you can about yourself, but also tell them why you're valuable. That's, that's what you're trying to tell them, not just the mm -hmm. where you worked and when you worked there. Right. But that you contributed and that you can make a place more successful. Yes, it differentiates you in other words. Every employer gets thousands of resumes, and they all look pretty much the same. They're looking for something that stands out. They're looking for a resume that differentiates the candidate. And the best way to do that, as I said, is what tangible value did you offer? Where did you go above and beyond? So then why is it overrated? Because is it, is it almost like, in some cases, a college degree, it gets you in the door, and then once they see you have it, they don't care about it anymore? Yes, that's true, but it's actually more than that. Too many people rely exclusively on their resume. They use it as the cornerstone of their search. That's a mistake. The resume should be thought of almost as an afterthought. It should be almost the last tool you use. It should be almost the least important tool in your toolkit. And the reason I say that is because think of applying for jobs. You're looking online, you're finding job postings, you're sending out 50 resumes a day. Well, that is the least effective way to look for a job. It just doesn't work. So in our business and in our counseling and our coaching with clients and all the public speaking I do, we do a lot on the subject of networking. Networking is the one best way to make that connection, to get that job, to move your career forward. So if I network, let's say I ask you if you know anybody in the... Um, you know, in the uh, shipping and transportation business. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh yes, I do actually. My brother-in-law, okay, fine. So now you introduce me. Now if I'm getting introduced personally, I don't need to send a resume. It would be a mistake to send a resume, in fact, because this is a personal introduction. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna show up to the person's office and shove a resume under their nose. Instead, I might bring another tool, something called a one-page biography. 
The one-page biography is a softer sell document. It gives a broad overview of your professional background, but it doesn't scream, I need a job. It doesn't scream, please hire me, I'm desperate, I need a job. So we teach clients how to have different attitudes at different times and use different tools for different purposes with different people. So if I hear you also, though, blast emailing your resume or, or going online and doing that, as a rule, is not the best thing to do. That's correct. Now, there are people who will want my money if I'm unemployed. They will promise me that they can get a job. Um, how do I know that's a good investment or a bad investment? It's never a good investment. Never, ever, 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 ever pay money to anyone who promises they'll get you a job. All right. When we talk about online job services, uh, job placement services, well, not placement, but they just are the listing agencies. They, right, like employment agencies or recruiters. I don't want to name brands, so recruiters. I'm trying to avoid that. that but let's say you can go on sites and there's a site that will tell you all these jobs in these professions are in your geographic area or all kinds right. of things. Um, how valuable are those kinds of sites? They're valuable as education. They're valuable as information. So for example, if I'm poking around online and I'm seeing that Vanguard Investment Company, let's say, has a lot of job openings. They seem to have job openings on all the websites. Instead of just sitting there and applying to all these jobs online, I'm going to say to myself, hmm, seems like Vanguard is growing. They seem to have job openings all over the place. Who do I know at Vanguard? Or do I know anybody who might know somebody at Vanguard? Hmm. So I'm going to get in through the back door. While all these people are sending in resumes and trying to get hired through the front door, I'm going to go around the back door. I'm going to go through my network, through my connections, get an introduction. I don't care if it's an introduction to a secretary or an introduction to the president. Somehow I'm going to get my foot in the door and begin a series of conversations. Okay, so I have my resume ready. I've gotten in the back door. I'm beginning to have a conversation. Now I'm conversing. What do I need to say and what shouldn't I say? Okay, good. What you should not say is, uh, thank you for meeting with me today. I'm so glad Steve referred me to you. By the way, I really need a job. Here's my resume. Would you hire me? You should not say that. Not a good idea. No. Okay. Because you're not there for an interview. You're there for a networking conversation. Mm. So you're not there to get a job, in quotes. You're there to learn. You're there to discover. You're there to make personal connections and to build your professional network. You, you're there to get advice and guidance. You're there to learn. Make that person become more aware of who you are and yes. be comfortable with you. Yes, and to make that connection so that the other person starts to see, this guy's pretty sharp. This guy really has a lot to offer. He asks good questions. It's almost like the employer will well, come that, up that's with a the good idea. Point. Should the interviewee or the, the person yes. going in be asking questions? Absolutely. And what kind of questions? Tell me about the industry. What do you think are the biggest challenges and needs that are coming up down the pike? Um, in your particular case, what would you say are the biggest challenges and issues you're facing at this company today? Can you ask what is it you're looking for and people you bring into this yes. company? Yes, in a general way. You could say, in general, when you bring in new people to the company, what kind of traits or qualities does the company look for most? What are the values or the, um, the what's the culture of the organization? See, you're asking probing questions. You can also say, uh, Steve, you've known me now for about half an hour. We've been talking, and I really appreciate your time. Um, if you were me, starting out in the field, what advice or guidance would you give a guy like me as I'm getting started? See, it's a general conversation. Mm -hmm. You're not focused on give me a job, give me a well, job. Now let's skip to a different scenario, though, where it is that kind of interview. The, the, they're interviewing 10 people in a day. You're one of them coming in. This is a job interview. Absolutely. This isn't a networking and event. And it's important to what, know the difference. What do you do there? Well, there it's a totally different kind of conversation because it's right out there in the open. They know they're interviewing people for a job opening. You know you're there as a candidate. They have your, res their resume, your resume in their hand. That's a very different dynamic. So in that case, you shift into another mode. The new mode is to make it clear that you're connecting your assets and strengths and experiences to the company's needs, problems, and challenges. The only way you can do that is to know what are the company's needs, problems, mm -hmm. and challenges. So you should have done a lot of research ahead of time on the internet, in conversations, through your network, and figuring out what are their needs, problems, and challenges. And then when you actually get there on the interview, you can be asking questions. You know, for this department, for this opening, what are some of the needs, problems, and challenges that are most important to you? If you had the ideal candidate, what would they start doing? What would they accomplish? How would you know six months from now that you hired the right person? 
What if someone just lacks confidence in themselves when they look at what their educational background is, if it's high school only, or if right. even if it's a college degree, but they see that others have masters or the degrees in a field that they're not, yes. that they haven't been working in, but they have experience in, and they just say, you know, I'd love to go for that job, but I just don't think I have the academic skill set right. that, that they'll even look at me. Well, if a person is truly unqualified for the position, if they don't have the basic requirements or qualifications, then don't apply for the job. You're just wasting everybody's time. Well, on the other hand, if it's a little bit of a stretch, if you have most of the qualifications, most of the education, a little bit of a stretch, that's okay. We, we can all make a little bit of a reach, mm -hmm. but it's important to explain to the, uh, inter to the interviewer why you might be a better candidate than someone else who has the degree or the master's or five more years experience. Where should my cell phone be during all this conversation? <laughs> That's a great question. It should either be off, and I mean off, in your briefcase or your pocket, or leave it outside of the building. It's amazing how many candidates act inappropriately during interviews. We've seen videos that are just horrifying when you look at what some candidates do. They're sitting there drinking water out of a bottle. They're sitting there taking cell phone calls and texting. You know, they're playing with their hair. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing to me. That's why people need some training. They need some grooming, you know? Mm -hmm. We encourage everyone to do role playing before they go into the interview process. Everyone needs to practice. They haven't done this in many cases in years. Mm -hmm. How can you expect yourself to go in and be perfect and a wonderful performer when you've never done this or you haven't done it in 15 years? All right, more on this in a moment. More with Ford Myers on getting the job you want as we continue on PHL 17. In Focus continues on PHL 17 with Ford Myers, author of Get the Job You Want Even When No One's Hiring and of Career Potential LLC. So, insider trading tip. Not trading, but employment tip. Well, I'll give you two quick tips. Number one, get some help. Every person, you, me, anybody, who's out there in the market looking for a new opportunity, get some help. Don't try this all by yourself. And when I say help, you can go back to your college uh, career placement office. You can go to CareerLink, which exists on the state level and the county level, which is free to the, uh, to, to the uh, resident. You can also um, go to seminars, webinars, all kinds of information online that's either free or very, very inexpensive. You can hire a career coach. But at any of these levels, get some help. Do something to boost your skills and to really, you know, get yourself some momentum in the market. How should we look at online and social media? Because we often are telling young people right. in middle school, high school, and college, be careful what you put right. on Facebook and Snapchat. And well, that's, that's another tip I was going to give you as an insider secret. Social media is not going to go away. It's here to stay. It's not a fad. We really need to embrace it. This is hard for some of the older folks in their 40s, 50s, and 60s because they didn't grow up with this. So it's a balance. Of course, you don't want to be all over the social media, you know, on every single platform and talking about what you had for dinner. On the other hand, you do want to be present and have some kind of a um, you know, visibility online. LinkedIn, for example, is extremely important for people who are working professionals. And you do need to be on LinkedIn. You do need to learn how to use it well. And I encourage every client and every person to have a very professional, very solid LinkedIn profile. If you were to suggest action steps then for anyone of any age, let's sort of summarize where we're at. Where do we begin? Okay. So if you find yourself in transition or thinking about making a change, you begin by doing what I call a personal and professional inventory. In other words, you stop. You look in the mirror and you say, okay, where have I been? Where am I now? Where do I want to go? What's important to me? What kind of role do I want in the work world? What kind of money do I want to make? Where do I want to live? What kind of environment do I want to work in? See, we have to slow down in order to speed up. You got to take stock. You got to be intelligent about this and create a plan. Too many people speed right into the job search. They lose their job on a Friday. They already sent out 100 resumes by Saturday morning. For what? What are they doing? Where are they going? If you ask them, they'll say, I don't know, I just need a job. The next action step would be once you kind of know what you want to do and where you want to live and what you're all about. Yeah. Uh, 
it's that approach, the attitude that you carry forward at that point, correct? Yes, and as I said before, I think everyone can benefit from some career counseling or coaching, again, whether it's back at the college, whether it's hiring a fresh professional, and I also think people should consider, if they're confused, if they need some direction, I think they should consider getting some career testing. You'd be amazed how clarifying it can be for many people. When we're in the interview process and say it's going fairly well, or maybe we don't even know how it's going, but we, we think it's going okay, do, what do I say at the end? How do you wrap it up? Great question. Here's what you should not say. You should not say, well, thank you. I hope to hear from you. No. What you want to do is maintain more control. Hmm. So you want to say, Steve, I really enjoyed meeting with you. This was a great conversation. I'm so glad that we had this interview. Tell me, what is your time frame for making a decision? And you'll say, well, I don't know, so I think two weeks. And I say, well, if I don't hear from you within, say, a week, may I contact you to see where things stand? And you'll probably say, yeah, okay, sure. And I'll say, well, do you prefer to be contacted by phone or by email? And you'll say, well, email's best. I'll say, great. So I'll contact you by email within a week if I don't hear anything. Is that all right? And you'll say, yes, that's fine. So you see, I'm maintaining some control. I'm showing real interest. We'll have to leave it there, Ford. I've enjoyed having this interview with Steve, you. Steve, it was great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Good. The book is called Get the Job You Want Even When No One's Hiring. The author is Ford Myers. For more information, you can also visit careerpotential.com. And that's in focus for this week. Thank you for watching. I'm Steve Highsmith. Enjoy your weekend and have a great week ahead.